Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, August 31st, 2006. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. Well, this week, home brewer Raj Apte joins us to talk about the mysterious ginger beer plant. The ginger beer plant used to be common in homes and was used to brew carbonated soft drinks, but Raj says prohibition was one of the causes of its downfall. We'll talk to Raj about his efforts to rediscover this unique brewing process. Also, we'll have a report on the Long Shot Homebrew Competition being sponsored by the Boston Beer Company from Rick Sellers of Pacific Brew News Radio. Well, speaking of our buddies in the podcasting world, congratulations to Jeffrey T. and the gang at the Good Beer Show for winning a podcast award for the second year in a row. The Good Beer Show was named Best Food and Drink Podcast by the voters at podcastawards.com. Nice work, guys. I also want to give a plug to Jeff and Greg at Craft Beer Radio. They were recently invited to go on a media tour of the Anheuser-Busch hop farms in Idaho, where they saw massive amounts of hops being harvested, processed, and baled on their way to becoming what Jeffrey T. would call football beer. (laughs) Uh, Apparently, Anheuser-Busch also showed off some uh, better beers to the press at the event, and Jeff and Greg talk about it on craftbeerradio.com. There are also pictures of all those wonderful hops. It was an interesting show and uh, lots of good information uh, about that. Speaking of hops, I want to put in a plug for Basic Brewing Video in this week's episode, which should be posted soon. Steve and I talk about homegrown hops and harvest ales. You get to see my, my own little homegrown Cascade hops and how I use them in a in a hoppy homebrew. And finally, on the program notes, look for an interview with yours truly, that would be me, on BigFoamyHead.com uh, this week. Rick, Dick, and I talk about homebrew and hops. And I want to apologize for not getting to uh, email this past week. One of my goals on this show is to keep the show less than an hour long. Uh, My reasoning behind that is I figure you guys have lives to lead (laughs) and other things to do uh, than listening to me. So I want to get a ton of useful information into a concise uh, format, a concise package. And uh, last week, Bob Bob Hansen's interview on high-gravity brewing had a ton of useful stuff, and we talked for a pretty long time, so I just postponed email until this week. But... I've got it right here this week. Got I got lots of uh, lots of email, and I've got more than what I'm reading here. But uh, let's get to it. Greg from Felton, California, wrote in after listening to last week's show. He said, "Just listened to your talk on high gravity beers with Bob Hansen. You had a quick exchange about the grist to liquor ratio expressed in pounds of each part, even though you use quarts to measure your water." So Bob talked about. Uh, the weight of water, and it reminded me of a saying. Uh, Greg says, a pint's a pound, the world around. But then I remembered that you are international, and I rethought the saying, a pint's a pound in my town, but a liter is a kilo everywhere else you go. <laughs> so <laughs> we're all we're all trying to be uh, international, and that's a good thing. So thanks, Greg. Something for everybody in that rhyme. A pint's a pound in my town, but a liter is a kilo everywhere else you go. Is that iambic pentameter? I don't know. Dave in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, uh, weighs in by saying, on the subject of units of measurement, I have to agree with my fellow listeners in the rest of the world, he says, apart from the U.S. and a few Caribbean countries, hearing the SI, uh, in other words, metric units, would be great. Not only are the U.S. slash imperial measurements more difficult to work with, and he says, how many ounces in a stone again? <laughs> what about a hogshead? Uh, he says the, the units uh, are difficult to work with and they aren't standardized. Not all gallons are created equal. Yeah, well, I, I hear you. They tried to re-educate us in the 70s, but uh, I, it just didn't stick. Uh, Dave continues, one thing that might get the home brewer with the spouse who doesn't like beer, some breathing room on brew days. I believe it was Matt that was trying to get his uh, fiance interested in uh, his beers. Uh, Dave suggests producing some ciders 
in addition to beer, either from scratch or from a kit. Cider is a great way to get non-beer lovers enjoying the fruits of brewing labor. That's a good good idea. Thanks for the note, Dave. Henry from Salt Lake City joins in on that theme. Henry says, I was listening to the question you received about trying to introduce someone to beer who doesn't like beer. My wife will try my beers to be nice to me and provide feedback, but doesn't really like the beer as something to drink. However, she does like malt coolers, so I'm currently brewing a batch of them for her. It's my first time doing it. Once I get them done, I'll let you know how they come out. Yeah, I'm, inter- I'm interested to see how they do come out. Uh, Dave says, I'm using extra light malt extract as the bulk of the fermentables, boosted by corn syrup and ma- maltodextrin for body. The flavoring is going to be an array of different Kool-Aid packets at bottling. We're going to try lots of different flavors and see which ones are best. I have high hopes for the watermelon cherry flavor. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. Very interesting. And probably not the sort of thing I'll be trying, but uh, uh, it's good you're thinking out of the box a bit and being creative with your with your brewing. You know, it all it's all in what you like. It's not about it's not about me. It's about what you and your your wife like. Let me know how the how the malt cooler thing comes out, and and uh, if they come out well, maybe we'll share the recipe. If you if you're interested in sharing the recipe. Uh, speaking of uh, out of the box things. Drew from St. Paul, Minnesota, writes after seeing Steve and me make beer desserts on Basic Brewing Video. Drew says, I'm emailing today to tell you of a very odd use of beer in re- in regard to your recent discussion of dessert and ales. Some of your listeners may regard this as alcohol abuse. Drew tells the story of an out-of-town visitor sharing a recipe using Great Divide Yeti Imperial Stout. Drew says, if you ever have a quart of high-end chocolate ice cream and 16 ounces of imperial stout, well, put it in a large bowl and mix them with a hand mixer. Don't wince. Don't grimace. Just do it. And then hand out the result to those people who like black Russians and all those creamy drinks. The intense bitterness of good imperial stout complements the chocolate and the creaminess of the ice cream cuts through the intense roasty notes. Drew says, it's the best milkshake I've ever had. Now, I, I wouldn't mind trying that. That uh, that that float with the uh, gi- uh, peach ginger beer that we had on a basic brewing video was, uh, it really switched my mind over on ice cream and beer. So anyway, if I ever get up my hands on a, a Yeti Imperial Stout, uh, you know, I might be tempted. Kevin from Lawrenceville, Georgia writes, during a visit to the nearby Fancy Pants grocery store, <laughs> I saw agave nectar in squirt bottles, like for honey. Have you ever heard of anyone using agave nectar in beer? It would not be cheap. These were $7 for 11 ounces, but it might be fun to try. Well, you know, agave nectar is the basis for tequila and also the basis for many throbbing headaches. <laughs> I haven't used uh, agave nectar in beer myself, but An- Anheuser-Busch has in a in a beer called Tequiza. I tried it um, several years ago, and uh, I remember it as being very sweet. However, I'm sure there are home brewers out there who could use the ingredient for some well balanced brews. So if you've if you've done that, let me know. Uh, Mark from Green Bay, Wisconsin, writes in with a brew day disaster and a call for help. Mark says. Uh, he was brewing early in the morning. He said he was already 30 minutes into my hour-long boil by 10 a.m. and was so ahead of myself that I decided to go fill the utility sink in my basement with ice and water for my wort cool-down prior to my boil getting done. I started the sink and went back outside to observe the boil and about 15 minutes later remembered about my water being on. Arg, says Mark. I guess that's the way that's pronounced. If so, Mark, Mark's a pirate. Uh, <laughs> needless to say, my finished off and carpeted basement was half flooded. After hearing my scream, the wife appeared downstairs to say, I think this is the single most stupid move you've ever done. <laughs> and Mark says that he agreed. Uh, Mark continues, Well, I can fix and dry the basement, but my biggest concern 
His biggest concern, mind you, is with my winter warmer spy sale that I was brewing, which I hope will be great after an extended aging period around Christmas. I did manage to cool down the wort and transfer the wort to my sterilized carboy, even in the chaos of the basement situation. I pulled the rubber number seven cork out of the sterilizing solution and pushed it into the top of my carboy, right through the neck into the carboy itself. I quickly put another cork on the carboy and aerated and pitched as usual. My question is, is the beer at high risk of contamination during fermentation from the embedded cork, or might it be okay? Should I remove the beer into the secondary as soon as fermentation seems complete? Well, first of all, I have to say that uh, Mark is a true home brewer. His basement is flooded. His wife is screaming at him. And his thoughts go to the rubber stopper sitting at the bottom of his winter warmer. <laughs> so there you go. That's the that's probably, you know, the majority of the people who listen to this show on a regular basis would be in the same uh, mindset, I'll, I'll bet you. Well, I told Mark not to worry about the stopper. If it was sanitized, then there's nothing uh, on the stopper that can hurt anything. And uh, even if there were some contaminants on the the stopper, if he tried to fish it out, he'd probably cause more risk of infection than just, you know, leaving it in there. So I told him to just proceed as normal, ignoring the stopper uh, in the carboy. So, Mark, good luck with the basement, the wife, and most of all, the beer. <laughs> Uh, Wild Bill from Seville up in Ohio sent me a link to a story on the NASA site about an experiment of uh, brewing beer in space. You know, I've wondered about that, if you could brew beer in space. The story was actually from 2001, um, appropriately, maybe. Any any Arthur C. Clarke fans out there? Uh, but I, I hadn't seen the story, even though it was from 2001. A graduate uh, college graduate uh, student from Colorado came up with the experiment and brewed a tiny amount of beer on the space shuttle. Uh, the, the experiment was sponsored by Colorado-based Coors. So, Coors in space. Draw your own conclusions. <laughs> you can find a link to the story in the description of this episode on Basic Brewing radio.com okay well I've got I got tons more email that I could catch up on but let's get to our report in the long shot competition from our buddy Rick Sellers from Pacific Brew News Radio the competition is being sponsored by the Boston Beer Company maker of Samuel Adams beers and Rick phoned in his report from San Francisco hey James this is Rick Sellers of Pacific Brew News and I am at the Long Shot Competition put on by Samuel Adams. This is a homebrew competition where the grand prize winner across the country will have their name and their beer brewed for a national distribution by Samuel Adams or Boston Brewing Company. There's five regions, and we're just one of the regions uh, doing judging today. The regions include San Francisco, where I am, San Diego, Chicago, Tallahassee, and Boston. In San Francisco today, we have 207 entries. In Chicago, there's at least 450. So a lot of variety from region to region. We have 30-plus judges on hand. We have a grandmaster judge and at least two master judges and a lot, a lot of very high-ranking judges. Great, great competition. The, the beers that we've judged so far, I've been on an American IPA panel, a English mild, a northern and a southern English brown ale, and American brown ales. The average scores are in the low 30s, some of them in the 20s, but we haven't had any really bad beers, which is a good thing. We also haven't had any spectacular beers that I have judged. I haven't talked to other judges to see exactly what they're getting, but we'll see. In attendance, we have a lot of really, really experienced judges, and the ratio of, of high-ranked judges indicates how great this competition is really going to be. It really provides validity to the competition to look around and know that these people know so much about their beer. It's almost time for the best to show around. I'm going to go and watch it. We're going to round up and wind up a day early, so that's a good that's a good thing. Boston Beer Company has 
provided us breakfast, lunch, and dinner today on Saturday. They're also buying us breakfast and lunch on Sunday. And just for the fun of being here, they're putting us in a hotel room. So right now I am at the, uh, the San Francisco Hilton in my hotel room and enjoying the day. I think pretty soon we're going to head down to the Tornado, maybe 21st Amendment, maybe Magnolia. Uh, there's a lot of big-time beer drinkers, so I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun. For Basic Brewing Radio, my name is Rick. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll talk to you next time, folks. Rick said in a follow-up email that the best of show for that region went to an old ale. So thanks to Rick Sellers for bringing us his perspective on the competition. I'm sure he'll, he'll have more in his podcast at PacificBrewNews.com. Now on to our interview with Raj Apte. Raj is an adventurous home brewer who's doing his part to revive the use of the mysterious ginger beer plant. Well, Raj Apte, welcome again to Basic Brewing Radio. It's my pleasure. Well, I got my issue of Zymergy today, and I don't know if you've seen Have you gotten your – do you subscribe to Zymergy? I do, but I haven't seen it yet. Well, in the, in the, in the coverage of the, uh, the homebrew conference, uh, Charlie Papazian is quoted as saying, The talks here are much more creative and innovative than anything I've ever seen at the Craft Brewers Conference or any other technical or professional conference. And it says that uh, Papazian had just attended a seminar on lactic acid beverages presented by home brewer Raj Apte, focusing on the ginger beer plant. Papazian said that Apte presented research that no professional that I know has ever done. So that's uh, you, you get a mention from the big guy. Well, in that's, that's quite an honor. Yeah, no kidding. You know, I, I have to say, I'm trying to remember whether I saw him in the audience, but. Uh, but I, I, I might not be able to remember the audience. <laughs> I was too busy thinking about ginger beer. <laughs> now let's uh, let's uh, go right. Well, first of all, you, uh, from talking to you at the at the conference, I get the impression that that your house is kind of a menagerie for um, odd, offbeat brewing bugs. That that's right. And and the one thing I have to say in my defense is that. The, uh, the colonization of my house by, by beneficial and non-toxic microorganisms is now so complete that when food spoils at my house, it usually spoils because it, it either grows a good Saccharomyces culture, a good Lactobacillus <laughs> culture, or uh, a good Penicillin culture. <laughs> so when, like when my bread goes moldy, it doesn't go moldy with the, the green or the black, which is poisonous. It grows moldy with the white, which is penicillin mold. Um, because of because of the number of cheeses I have ripening nearby, <laughs> so you don't even use a refrigerator anymore. <laughs> I, you know, um, the only thing I use my refrigerator for, in fact, my refrigerator right now is has a carboy in it, um, uh, to the exclusion of all else, because the apple season has come in, and the Gravensteins this year are excellent. So I, I typically do uh, uh, between three and five uh, ba- five gallon batches of cider each year. And uh, I do a, a, a sweet style of cider of the, of the northern French style. And that requires a fair amount of chilling because what you're really trying to do in that case is stick the fermentation. So in that, that case, the, the uh, cider is bubbling away, and I stick it in the fridge and really shock it and try to stick the fermentation to keep it as a sweet cider. So ferment, or refrigeration at your house is just for brewing. The food doesn't need – you don't have to worry about spoiling food because it just gets better. That's right, and the, the sourdough certainly grows, and the yeast and the and the cheese certainly ripens. <laughs> and you're probably, you know, infection free from all the uh, penicillin. Well, let's let's get talking about the uh, the ginger beer plant. When I read the the title of your presentation in the in the brochure, it, the words ginger beer plant evoke this, you know, picture in my mind of a, of a plant with a stem and roots and leaves and a cotyledon or two, you know, and mm-hmm. and uh, it's nothing like that. It's kind of a wad of goo, isn't it? It, it is a wad of goo, and it looks very much like a kefir grain. Um, and I think the word plant in that circumstance is like the word factor uh, or factory. You know, 200 years ago, a factory w- or a factor was just a guy who was busy involved with trading. And I think a plant was anything that manufactured something. Hmm. So if you had a ginger beer plant... I think that referred to, uh, a, say, a ceramic or, or crock vessel that had this, this kefir-type grain 
in it, but the whole thing was referred to as a plant because it was used to manufacture ginger beer. Oh, I see. So it's not referring to the organism itself. It's referring to the whole system there. Yeah, I think it's a little confusing as to which one it refers to, but, but to my mind, and at least looking at the etymology, I think it originally referred to as a, as a means of production, and then it became clear. Uh, I mean, you know, in the case of beer, it's a little bit of a stretch to understand that yeast is the causative fermentative agent, uh, because until you have a good flocculating yeast, which I don't know whether they had in antiquity, until you have a flocculating yeast, you can't really see the yeast, so to speak. Right. Um, and in the ginger beer plant, you can see it right away because the, the blob is a jelly blob, and it, it, it has a very clear definition. Now, the, I don't know whether we should talk about what the thing is or what it produces first. What do you think is the best approach to talk about this? Let, let's, let's, I, I think it's better to approach it kind of historically. Um, you know, this was a fermentation that was, that was commonplace 150 years ago. And nobody knows quite when it was first done in Europe. There are quotations, certainly back to the Crimean War, and some people claim that it came from Crimea. Other people claim that it comes from the New World, and there's a relationship between tibby grains and, uh, and ginger beer plants. Now, tibby grains are another gelatinous blob that, that are involved with the fermentation. And tibby grains are typically found on the Apuntia cactus and are... Uh, are a fermentation used to make a alcoholic beverage in Mexico um, where you ferment cactus juice and or other juices uh, to make a beverage. Now, whether ginger beer is the same or not is extremely problematic, and there are flame wars in the ginger beer community um, <laughs> about whether <laughs> this is... I mean, not really flame wars, because it's a, it's, a, it's a relaxed community, but there's certainly confusion. <laughs> and the best I can determine that they are... They are certainly distinct in the sense that they produce different flavored uh, beverages. So they are at least as distinct as different strains of yeast. But whether they rise to the level of different genuses or different organisms, that's unclear. Now, the, the beverages that you served at this session in Orlando were non-alcoholic. Well, it, they were technically non-alcoholic. So the, the ginger beer plant is a, is a lactobacillus, it's, or it's a colony of lactobacillus. And there's one organism, um, Lactobacillus hilgardii, or Lactobacillus brevis. It's one organism. It's got many names. But this one organism is the, the basic organism. But you can have plenty of other things living in with the ginger beer. And if you practice non-sterile uh, propagation, which is what ginger beer is famous for being able to do, then you can end up with all sorts of good stuff, like including Britannomyces and Pediococcus and other things growing in it. So it's a little hard to know exactly what's there. But the, the primary lactobacillus produces on the order of half a percent of, of alcohol and maybe a, a third of that lactic acid. So the, the alcohol level technically is non-alcoholic, although there's, a, there's just a touch of it in there. And that's probably enough to keep a lot of the spoilage uh, and pathogenic bacteria from growing. So it, it does have the same kind of disinfectant qualities that beer does in terms of making the water clean. Now, when you make a root beer... Uh, homebrewed root beers, I understand it. I've never done it, but you have to. You basically, uh, you're priming it and you're watching it, and then you refrigerate it before the but the bottles start to blow, right? Uh, you don't. Do you have this problem with the the ginger beer, or do you can you just let it go and do its thing and and have it be stable? You, you've asked exactly the right question, and and the magic of the ginger beer plant is that it is very temperature sensitive, much more temperature sensitive than regular yeast are. So if you were to take, if you want to make a sweet a soda pop type um, beverage and you use a regular yeast as the, uh, as the, quote, as the priming, so you really have a sweet beverage, you want it to be sweet, but you want the gas to come from, from a microorganism, then if you use the yeast, you really need to be careful that the that the bottles don't explode because even at refrigerator temperatures, uh, the if there are any lager yeast components to the yeast that you're using, mm. they will start, you know, and slowly ferment and produce a bottle bomb. Um, and of course, many of us have had experiences of using and, uh, you know, bottling a beer that's not fully attenuated, and seeing that those yeast, even at refrigerator temperatures, slowly work uh, and slowly get things done. Of course, of course, I, I have no idea what you're talking about there. 
<laughs> I'm lying. <laughs> yeah, anyone who hasn't poured out, anyone who won't admit to pouring out beer or blowing up a few bottles <laughs> is a bit of a fibber. <laughs> you haven't lived yet. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the the neat thing is that this lactobacillus is it's a mesophilic bacterium, and it likes to grow at basically at body temperature, human body temperature, maybe even a little cooler. So somewhere between 28 and 35 is its optimum zone, and below say 20 or 15, it's really quite dormant. It doesn't doesn't really metabolize much. And so you can refrigerate beverages for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time, and they, and they stay fizzy. And even at room temperature, if you live in a cool climate, uh, or say during winter, during, at room temperature, the bottles will last the few weeks that it takes for you to actually consume the beverage. Hmm. Th- these are not bottles that you want to cons- that you want to produce for six months or a year and bottle condition. These are things that you condition for a few weeks and then consume. You had the you had the bottles in uh, they were uh, uh, the the gross gross style flip top bottles and and they were um, pretty fizzy down there in Orlando. I don't know if the temperature down there had anything to do with it or not. But there was certainly I think it was mainly that they had been shaken up in transit I mean, ah. um, because of uh, a snafu with the airline. Instead of coming 24 hours in advance, I was I arrived just the night before my talk. So those bottles had not sat for more than 12 hours, uh, and I suspect they were probably pretty well stirred up by the uh, by the airplane flight before that. But at, at home, I tend to actually do it in a uh, soda siphon, and you know we all remember the soda siphons from Abbott and Costello and the Marx Brothers right. uh, with a lever and you squirt. Well, I have a couple of those, and you can find those on the internet. They're for sale, and the the modern ones, of course, have a little valve so that you can take a CO2 cylinder and and charge it up, but of course I'm doing it naturally, so I'm essentially siphon conditioning. So I will um, I will produce ginger beer and I'll siphon it into there or, or or pour it into there, um, leaving the ginger beer plant aside. So what goes into the siphon is just liquid, and then uh, cap it and leave it out for a day, and that's usually enough to give it a fizz. And the nice thing with a soda siphon is you can sort of test it and pour half a glass and see what the pressure looks like. And when the pressure's right, you put it in the fridge, and it's good for weeks. Hmm. Now, the, the the glass that I tried uh, was kind of a lemony flavor, and I guess you can you can flavor it in in a bunch of different ways, right? Yeah, and and it, this is one of the fun parts is that this gets into maybe like mead makers have a lot of fun playing around with spices, and I mean they can do whatever they want. They've got so much alcohol in the mead typically that they aren't worried about contamination, so they can just throw whole spices in whatever they feel like. And uh, ginger beer is like that. And it, when I first made ginger beer, I started off usually boiling the water for, at first. But now I, do, I don't even do that. I, the only heat that I use is heat to try to es- extract flavor from the spices. Mm. So in the case of ginger, the flavor is best if you warm it up to, say, 60 or 80 or even t- to, to boiling temperature just for a moment. Um, otherwise, it has a bit of a green uh, raw flavor. And so with the spices also, you can add the spices cold at the end, or you can add the spices into the ginger tea uh, hot, and you'll get a different flavor extraction. But, yeah, I I have a list uh, that I presented of different spices that you can add. Um, Lemon, of course, is an obvious one because that that really, uh, I think, goes well with ginger. But cinnamon, um, cloves, nutmeg, uh, and vanilla are traditional things that you can add. Um, one thing that I supplied uh, for people to taste at uh, at the AHA convention was uh, hibiscus leaf hmm. as a seasoning, and that that's known in the in the Spanish community, uh, Spanish speaking community as jameca, and you can get it in any of the Mexican grocery stores here in California. It's uh, it's a dried red leaf or flower petal, and it's the it's the dried flowers of the hibiscus plant, and it's used to make a beverage called jameca. Um, which you can get at a lot of the Mexican restaurants around here. But I think it makes a great seasoning for, for ginger beer as well. Um, so that was one that I added. And then other spices that were not probably available in Europe or at least were quite expensive, like cardamom or anise. If you add anise, you can get a licorice flavor, and you can get a lovely kind of a licorice flavored uh, beverage with anise, almost like an anisette, like Pernod. Hmm. Um, and you can play all of the games that Europeans play with uh, with schnapps, they you know they will typically uh, distill a fruit brandy and then add spices. And 
I, I don't know, there must be 500 different kinds of schnapps in Europe, each with different spice blends, and they all provide, you know, good starting points for experimenting with spices in ginger beer. Now, how in the world did you find out about this, and how did you get uh, your first sample to start playing with? This, this is something that I, I had always been interested in, how you could make soft drinks, ginger beer or root beer, and I and I do love ginger beer. Um, there's a, a place in, I think it's in South Carolina, Blenheim's, that makes a fantastic ginger beer. Um, but it's uh, it's basically ginger and water and caramel cover, uh, caramel color, and then um, for, and then bought force condi- force uh, carbonated, so it has no fermentation. And I had always wondered about ginger beer recipes that I had read in various homebrew uh, books, and none of them were sweet like the old-fashioned ginger beer. Um, so that's when I started looking for this, and I found a couple of websites that talked about this ginger beer plant, um, but I couldn't find an actual sample of it. Um, and there was there was one that was particularly frustrating from a, a British, there's a British website from the National Center for Yeast Cultures in the United Kingdom that said that they had a sample of ginger beer plant, but that they wouldn't give it out to the public because they couldn't verify that it was not toxic. Yeah. And so they had it, but they were not going to supply it. But they and other people told me about uh, a German tissue bank that had a sample of it. And the provenance of that sample in the German bank is not not been clear to me. I haven't been able to get the Germans to tell me where, you know, who deposited it and when it was deposited. But it may date from the 50s or may even date from earlier than that. Um, and the people that I had talked to were having trouble getting it out of the German tissue bank because they, of course, only deal with universities and, and biotech companies. And the fact that I work in a research lab turned out to be very advantageous. So I sort of uh, slightly surreptitiously used our company letterhead <laughs> and uh, and wrote to the Germans. And I think it helped that I wrote in uh, in idiomatic German uh, with the help of one of the postdocs that is working in our laboratory, uh, who is from the same town. And and that seemed to grease the skids, that and, and uh, 75 euros, and, uh, and I was on my way. Wow. And when the first sample came, I was just dreadfully afraid of killing it. They, uh, mercifully, they had given us two sterile vials, uh, each with a small amount of the ginger beer plant. And I messed around with it for must, maybe two or three months, slowly growing it under sterile conditions, using information that I had gleaned from some research that was published in France uh, in the mid-80s. Uh, and slowly I figured out that the sterile propagation method that I was using was not particularly useful. Um, I could grow the plant, but but I needed, but it wasn't really ginger beer that I was producing. So then I went and took a piece of it and started doing a non-sterile propagation using, you know, real ginger and just propagating it in the traditional way or in as close to the traditional way as I could figure out. Um, and at the same time, I got a copy of a paper from 1892 from a, from a guy named Ward uh, who published an article in the Philosoph- Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And this 1892 paper is a, is a great example of how wonderful science was 100 years ago, where somebody would study something for two or three years, write a 50-page paper, and just completely cover all of the basic questions um, in, a, in, a, in wonderful detail. And this, so this paper, to me, was kind of a revelation, because as a scientist, modern science is oftentimes done in three- or four-page papers that just tackle things a bit, and then you publish... You seem to publish, have to publish, you know, one every couple of weeks or a couple of months. So this Ward paper uh, went into detail about how ginger beer was grown both traditionally and in the lab in the U.K. And, um, and using techniques that he proposed, uh, I was able to start making actual ginger beer. Uh, and then, then, of course, then the art kicks in and the science gives way, and you start trying to figure out how to make something that actually tastes good. Mm. Um, there's a company that sells ginger beer plant called Fermented Treasures, and um, I asked them where they got their ginger beer plant from. They appeared around the same time I started experimenting with ginger beer, so they didn't have the ginger beer plant when I needed it. Um, they only got into business after I first obtained it from uh, uh, from Germany, and they claim that they got theirs from the same source, from the same German tissue bank. So, um, so that's a, a place that I refer people to, uh, if they'd like to buy some, 
And they came up with a couple of decent recipes. The, the lemony recipe that you tasted was from, from their recipe. Hmm. Um, and it, that added more lemon than I would have ever thought to add. I was adding just a tinch of lemon because that's in, in the traditional recipes, people are adding a teaspoon to a tablespoon per liter. Um, and these guys wanted sort of four to six tablespoons hmm. uh, per liter. So it was, a, it was a bit of a departure, and as you said, it produced a pronounced lemon flavor, but almost like a lemonade then. Um, and I think a carbonated lemonade can be made with the same ginger beer plant with little or no ginger. Hmm. Now walk us through the process. What do you, on your normal brew day uh, for a, a, a ginger beer, what, what's the process? Okay. Um, so the, the, the first thing is that I don't, I don't make five gallons at a time because this is not something that seems to benefit by long aging, uh, long bulk aging, for example, like, a, like a, an ale or a lager would. And, and it's not something that holds up in bottles at room temperature for long periods of time. So, so I tend to make it in these soda siphon quantities, one or two or at most four liters at a time. And so start off with just regular water. Um, you can condition the water if, if your water doesn't taste good uh, by itself. And what I'll do is I'll typically, the day before I want to brew, I'll take some ginger, uh, fresh ginger root, I'll peel it, and I'll throw it in the blender and blenderize it until I have ginger pulp. And I'll typically need to feed in uh, some water uh, into the blender to make that pulp. And I'll throw that in the microwave and heat it until it's uh, boiling temperature and then let it steep overnight. The longer you let the ginger pulp sit uh, in the water, um, the hotter the water gets. Uh, the better extraction you get from the ginger. And I want my ginger beer to be as spicy as possible uh, because that's the way I like it. Mm -hmm. So I let it sit overnight or maybe even a, a day and a night. Um, so now I have this wet ginger pulp, and I put that into into a uh, potato ricer, which is essentially just a small sieve with, a, with the ability to squeeze. And, and I squeeze out all of the ginger juice, leaving the pulp behind. Uh, so now I have ginger juice. And to that, I add uh, lemon or sugar, well, lemon and sugar. Um, one traditional ingredient is cream of tartar, which is, uh, which is the, a salt of tartaric acid. And that's a traditional thing to add, and there's some debate about why. Um, it may be that it adds a little bit of acidity, uh, but, of course, lemon adds far more acidity. So if you have lemon, maybe you don't need cream of tartar. I have a theory that the reason you add cream of tartar is that it has uh, potassium in it. It's, it's a salt of tartar, tartaric acid, and it has potassium in it. And potassium seems to be an important nutrient for the growth of lactobacilli. Hmm. And so I think it has that benefit. But, so it's an optional ingredient. I have no idea. There's clearly room for experimentation to determine how much. But I add a gram per liter of, of tartaric, uh, cream of tartar. Um, and then I add uh, maybe 50 grams of ginger beer plant, um, some sort of hand-sized lump of ginger beer plant. The ginger beer plant can grow very large single lumps, but if you a mechanically agitate them or grab them or do anything, they tend to break down into a couple of millimeter-sized chunks. And so typically I'm adding kind of a slurry of these three to four to five millimeter uh, jelly blobs, uh, not quite as a paste, but more like like uh, ta wet tapioca or something. And so now we've got uh, a sugar solution, typically between 5 and 15% sugar uh, to water. Um, we've got ginger flavor. We've got lemon. We've got uh, tartaric acid. We've got any spices that we wanted to add to this. And then I'll uh, put a fermentation lock on it, uh, although that's not strictly necessary. Uh, and I'll put it in a warm spot. And the traditional traditional thing to do is to put it for two days in a warm, sunny windowsill in, in England. And heaven knows what temperature a warm, sunny windowsill in England is, but I would guess <laughs> about 25. I find that I've just put it on a hot plate at 30, and in 24 hours, it's uh, very, it's bubbling rapidly, and that's basically your sign that you've got plenty of, of uh, bacteria growing in the solution. And at that point, I usually then have to decide whether I want this to be very sweet, a little bit sweet, or not sweet at all. And some people like it not sweet at all, and they'll let it ferment for three or four days before, before uh, uh, moving on. 
but I'll typically let it go a day to produce a medium sweetness, at which point I then strain the liquid out, leaving the ginger beer plant and any residue behind. The residue, of course, consists of some yeast leaves, uh, as you would expect. There is yeast growing um, along with the bacteria, but the yeast is uh, sort of a minor participant and is, produces just a little bit of a deposit at the bottom. Um, so I'll take this liquid now and I'll put it into the soda siphon or into Grolsch bottles. It's only a day old at this point. I'll put it in the fridge and I'll let it uh, rest for three days to a week. Now, originally I used to keep it outside warm for at least a day to carbonate, but I found that if I had a really active fermentation and I put it at room temperature in a jar and then put that in the fridge, by the time it chills down, it's actually produced a fairly decent carbonation. Ah. So that's something people have to play with, depending on whether they really like it, like it, like it spritzy or like it just mildly prickly. Um, and if I, if you leave it out for a day or two, you can get something that will definitely bottle bomb if you do it in a Grosch bottle. But in a seltzer bottle, you can actually dispense some fairly lively uh, ginger beer. And that's kind of fun. I mean, you can definitely get it to spray across the room um, <laughs> <laughs> unintentionally. <laughs> now, usually on the show, we're, we're talking in, uh, in Fahrenheit and having to remember to translate to Celsius. Uh, you know, and then I get emails from uh, Europe and from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, but you say 25 to 30 degrees uh, Celsius. What does that translate to Fahrenheit? I guess uh, 70 to 85 or something like that. Okay. Um, thir- let's see, 30 degrees centigrade is, uh, yeah, should be about 80 in the in the low 80s. I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah, and so the, <laughs> but the point is it's a sunny windowsill type of a number. Mm-hmm. And obviously if you live in Tucson or if you live in Maine, uh, you it's better to use the temperature numbers than, yeah. than a sunny windowsill. <laughs> but, um yeah, but and it's one of these things. It's extremely forgiving. So if you if you do keep it at at 25 or I mean, say at room temperature or even a cool room temperature, um, it will ferment. It'll just take three to five days to get going instead of 12 hours or 24 hours. And it's you know so it's extremely forgiving. And because you drink it fresh or reasonably fresh, you can do a lot of experiments with it and play around with it. And it's one of the reasons why I brought a bunch of samples to AHA and handed them out because I want a bunch of people playing around with it and experimenting. This was something where every, every household in Europe 150 years ago had their own recipe, and probably every household in America had their own recipe. It was prohibition that marked the end of home fermentation in the ah. United States. And, of course, that killed the ginger beer plant just as much as, as it killed uh, home brewing. Even but though, the, even though the, the alcohol level is so low? Even though the alcohol level is so low, yeah. The, the prohibition people... Um, I mean, maybe it was also just the question of people leaving farmhouses and moving to the cities, but a lot of fermentation was practiced in the home uh, 200 and 150 years ago that we just don't do anymore. Uh, I'm thinking of sauerkraut and mm. buttermilk. and I mean, sauerkraut is the easiest thing in the world to make at home. Why people buy it, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I think fermentation sort of moved into disrepute uh, in, the, in, in the time around Prohibition. It's just bizarre that 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 this the ginger beer thing has just been com- completely forgotten. Yeah, and and th- I have a friend in the UK who's done some research looking at at uh, the literature, um, looking at magazine articles through databases, and there is a lot of mention of ginger beer plants a hundred years ago in the U.S. as well as the U.K. Uh, and of course Europe as well, um, and. Uh, yeah, it just completely disappeared. And in the case of Europe, it was, I mean, two world wars is enough to make you forget about all sorts of, oh, uh, yeah. you know, fun little home things when you're dealing with the devastation and destruction of, of all of that. Well, but, and, uh, al- and also uh, the pioneers, the American pioneers, everybody had a sourdough starter. Everyone had a sourdough starter. Probably people were making their beer with their sourdough starter. Uh, I mean, you, you know, you never really know how many different cultures people used to keep in the house. Mm. But... Uh, the ginger beer would have been another distinct starter. Um, sauerkraut, you don't even really need a starter. Um, cheese, probably cheese. You know, people, who, once they set up a, a homestead, would, would develop their own cheese cultures. Um, uh, s- uh, sausage. I mean, sausage is fermented, and a lot of people don't 
really understand that sausages are fermented. They, uh, they depend on Pediococcus and Lactobacillus to acidify. Um, and they ripen like cheese with a white mold on the outside. And if you go to a good butcher, you'll see those white sausages uh, hanging like salamis and so forth should have mo white mold on the outside. And somehow everyone has grown afraid of germs rather than understanding that there are some good germs and some bad germs. And maybe we'd, we, this is way out there, but maybe we would have fewer allergies if we would have a healthy uh, crop of what you've got living in your house. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I would hope so. Um, I, I wonder about allergies. I always think kids should just eat a lot of dirt. And, <laughs> Um, my mom says that uh, that I used to eat a fair amount of dirt as a kid. <laughs> um, um, but uh, but anyway, yeah, I, I think generally speaking that there are a lot of positive um, biological organisms, and people should learn to not be afraid of, of that. One thing that just shocks me, and it should shock people as much as, say, how bad beer was in the United States before the homebrew revolution, is uh, Americans eat their cheese unripened. Hmm. They'll eat their brie when it's completely unripe and firm, and most don't understand that you need to ripen a cheese uh, to a point which is determined by the taste of the family, but certainly extremely unripe is not a, is not a taste. It's just buying stuff off the shelf and eating it right away. Um, yeah, a lot of these things need to be ripened and cared for just like good beer needs to be cared for. Now, one of the slides in your presentation is, is called Get Your Kids Fermenting. So do you, do you involve kids in, in your uh, ginger beer making? You know, I don't have kids uh, of my own yet, and so I've played around. I've certainly served ginger beer to kids um, with parents that are particularly tolerant of crazy people um, <laughs> and, and microorganisms. But, you know, if I drink it and I say claim that I've been drinking from that, from that soda siphon for the last three days and had no bad effects, <laughs> Some parents will be reasonable and will let their kids drink bacteria. But, yeah, it's, it's one of these things. I think this is a great way for, to get kids excited by, by fermentation. And it's one of the things – so, you know, I, I'm hoping to start a family. And, and what, if I do have uh, kids, I really do hope that, that when they get to college, their experience of beer is such that they know what good beer tastes like. They – don't want to drink crappy beer, and they don't want to drink till they're inebriated. Mm -hmm. I want to produce beer snobs, and I'm hoping that beer snobbery will – that I can produce kids that are beer snobs, and that will protect them from the abuse of alcohol, uh, which is so rampant in high school and college, because it's a forbidden thing. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, most of the beer is so awful tasting, one can be forgiven for thinking that the only benefit it has is to make you drunk. Yeah. To drink as cold as possible and as fast as possible. Uh, exactly. Or drink, uh, you know, vodka plus fruit juice to, uh, or, or Alka-Pops. I mean, people drink that because they they haven't been able to afford uh, or haven't been given the opportunity to buy good quality uh, liquors and beers and wines. Well, we've kind of gotten off on a tangent, but... <laughs> we have. <laughs> but, you know, that's uh, that's part of the fun of, uh, of homebrewing and, and talking about homebrew. Uh, you get enthusiastic, and then you you kind of go off and stand on a on a uh, a soapbox somewhere. Uh, is there? Oh, one important question: How do you keep the ginger beer plant alive? Well, so the ginger beer plant seems to be hard to destroy, and and I have yet to kill uh, or destroy any of it. Um, they propagate as you as you propagate in solution. They grow slowly and. Depending on who is doing it, and I've got different correspondence of people, you know, with people that that who I've sent ginger beer plants to. Some of them claim that it it doubles in quantity every two weeks for them. Some people claim that it doubles in quantity every two months. So that's kind of the range. And and I have yet to really understand exactly why it's growing so much faster for some people hmm. than for others. I'm wondering, for example, if it isn't related to that phosphorus question. People with hard water may be the ones who have the faster growth because minerals are an important part of the nutritional cocktail hmm. to make lactobacillus grow happily. And yeah. so I have, you know, from the scientific literature, I have, uh, I know what makes lactobacillus grow, and I certainly know what makes this one grow. But how to translate that into ordinary water chemistry is something I haven't quite done yet. But potassium and phosphorus seem to be important for it to grow. But basically, it's, it's a jelly blob, and as long as you keep it wet, uh, or actually you can even dry it and then, and then resuscitate it, 
I think fermented treasures, when they sell it, I think they sell it dried, and they give you instructions on how to rehydrate it. Um, and I think they do that just for ease of transport. Sure. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it needs to be kept either from refrigerator temperatures up to uh, close to body temperature. Uh, and uh, interestingly, they like light. They like sunlight. Hmm. And I think it's partly because it, most microorganisms hate sunlight. Not only does, does sunlight skunk beer, but it actually inhibits or harms yeast growth. And this lactobacillus appears to be able to be tolerant of that. So, um, so you can leave it out in the sun, and it's fine. Um, I, if you don't feed it for a few weeks, it takes a little while for it to get going again, but it'll get going. Um, it's a spore-forming type of uh, an organism, which a lot of us ha- have an experience with brewer's yeast, which is specifically bred to be non-spore-forming, mm-hmm. which means it's very easy to kill and sometimes hard to revive. Um, a spore-forming, the spore-forming version of, of any of these things means that you can pretty much revive it with just one or two cycles of feeding. And so it's it appears to be relatively hard to kill. Is there any thought of uh, mutation over time? Um, there is, and in my mind, uh, it's a good thing. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, if you're Chimay and you have a very specific yeast that you've cultivated over hundreds of years, the idea of mutation is maybe a bad idea. But Chimay didn't start off with Chimay yeast. They started off with some generic yeast, you know, two. 200 or 300 years ago, and bred their own one by selective breeding from from batch to batch based on what tasted good. And and I think that uh, in the best of all worlds, 100 years from now, there will be different lineages of ginger beer plants, and maybe you would go to, to Y Yeast or White Labs 100 years from now, and they would have five different flavors of ginger beer plant, just like they have dozens of different kinds of yeast. And maybe one would be named after you. Maybe. Um, I, one of the things that I've been playing around with recently is instead of using a fermentation lock uh, on the ginger beer, I let it ferment open, mm. which, is, uh, which is traditional. They didn't have fermentation locks as part of the ginger beer tradition 100 years ago. Um, and I let a Brett pellicle grow on the surface of my ginger beer. I use one of the, uh, the White Labs uh, uh, Britannomyces strains, and it produces a nice kind of a pineapple-y, citrusy uh, flavor. Hmm. Um, so I let the Brett pellicle grow on top of the ginger beer, and then that Brett becomes incorporated into this ginger beer plant, where the plant means the vessel, the dirty vessel that has, uh, say, some Brett scum on the top and some ginger beer plant stuff on the bottom and some yeast. And as long as I'm not too careful to wash that out uh, thoroughly or sanitize it, uh, I go ahead and propagate it from, from batch to batch, and it seems to be pretty good. And then you'll get what they used to call uh, spontaneous fermentation from your from your dirty vessel, right? That's right, and, and, and I think that that's how people used to do things. So in terms of recreating historical beers, you know, people can play around with that. One time when I was in uh, uh, Ecuador, uh, at a tr- uh, I was on a tour there in the Napo River Valley, they took us to see how people made beer from the, uh, I think it was the cassava root or the taro root, taro root, and they take these, they dig up these big roots in the jungle and they mash them, and they ferment them and they make a very nice, uh, well, a very strange but very nice beer out of it, um, and so we we saw how they do that and they have a a plastic uh, 33 gallon garbage can which is their magic vessel, and it's loaded with yeasty crud all over the inside of it and they throw these ground up roots into it and they ferment it and they pour the beverage out and they sort of make a haphazard attempt to clean it but they always leave at least a centimeter thick layer of crud on the inside Hmm. and that's (laughs) that's their magic (laughs) spontaneous uh vessel you know kind of like the infected uh infected wood in in brussels Mm mm-hmm well, this is amazing, this stuff. It's, a, it's, it's really fun to talk about, and I'm sure it's fun to do. Yeah, it is, and I, I hope that, you know, one of the things I always fear about, uh, about homebrewing is you do need a modest amount of equipment, and, and it really does benefit from sterile or pseudo-sterile, you know, sanitation technique. And for me, the most daunting thing when I first learned homebrewing was 
how careful do you need to be with sanitation? And, you know, you can get sloppy later on, but early on, if you're sloppy, you get enough bad results that you usually give up the hobby. Mm-hmm. So this is nice because it's a completely, it's, it's amenable to completely non-sterile conditions. And it's so robust that, that you can't produce a bad ginger beer, as far as I can tell. Sometimes they're a little funky, um, but, uh, you know, they're never, they're never harmful. Well, Raj, I, I appreciate your taking time out again to talk to us. And I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that with your prolific uh, uh, endeavors in the homebrewing uh, field, that we'll be talking again. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. If you if you come up with something new and interesting, uh, let me know. <laughs> yeah, this year I'm focusing on uh, on wine and cider because uh, I've been running low on cider uh, the last year, and uh, my wife is particularly fond of my the sweet cider that I make. So so I'm doing that now, but. Uh, I've got a I've got a um a beer that I'm going to show at the Northern California Festival um that's coming up in I guess 2 months now maybe a month and a half uh that has uh, four different genera in it. It's got a Saccharomyces, a Torula spora, a uh uh one other that I can't even remember at the top of my head <laughs> and a Britannomyces. Uh and all four together make just a wonderful fruity ale um and that's become my new house beer. So Wow. Uh, maybe we'll talk about uh, multi multi genera beer uh, sometime in the future. That would be amazing. Well, th- I will I will put a link on our website on basicbrewingradio.com to uh, to your website if you want me to. That would be uh, that'd be a great honor. Oh, well, terrific! And uh, we will talk to you next time. Okay. Thanks, Raj. Good brewing to you. Well, thanks again to Raj Opte. Look for links to Raj's presentation from Orlando and to Fermented Treasures. I, keep in mind, I don't have any personal experience with uh, Fermented Treasures, good or bad. I'm just putting the link out there for your reference and for your convenience. Uh, next week, I hope to have a tasting of one of the uh, small batch hop experiments that you've heard us talk about on the show. So keep your fingers crossed for that one. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And while you're on our site, you can check out our online shop where you can find great pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to save you even more. In Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, we walk you through the extract brewing process uh, step-by-step or stop-by-stop. Uh, from boiling to bottling and in basic brewing stepping into all grain we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort including batch sparging and uh, fly sparging and fusion mashing and step mashing all kinds of stuff you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com and if there isn't a vendor in your area you can order it from us online Well, that's all until next week. Until then, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. So long.